coming up on this week's program. Car free in Madrid. This is like being a kid again. Woohoo! Digging the Dutch masters. And it's downhill all the way in the mountains of Latvia. We start this week in the Spanish capital, Madrid, where change is coming fast. The way people get around the city is being transformed. City officials are clearing the cars from the congested streets and opening them up to new possibilities, rentable electric scooters. They've become increasingly popular in many European cities of late. For lots of people, it's a transport revolution they've been waiting for. For others, it's something else entirely. We have put too many, too many in Madrid. Madrid resident Rafa Estefania reports. Look, look at this. Electric scooters, bicycle sharing. Everybody seems to be sharing means of transport now in Madrid. Nobody seems to use their own bikes, their own uh, scooters anymore. We got here the uh, electric bikes, they've been charged at the moment, and over there, a line full of electric scooters. They are everywhere. It seems that everybody in Madrid are using them to move around. And they are just part of the story. Faced with some of the worst pollution in Europe, city officials hope to reduce it by 40% by taking the most polluting vehicles off the road in a plan they call Madrid Central. Meanwhile, on all roads, once created to adapt the city around the new automobiles of the time, new spaces have been created for pedestrians. Gran Vía is the new street, the new street from the beginning of the 20th century. But... Tour guy Pedro agreed to show me round. It's fantastic because as a guy, I can see you from this point of view, from this, this place for the very first time after yes, the renovation. I've never, never been able to look at this building from this from this angle. Uh, this is because all, all this is new, right? It was full of traffic going around and it was almost impossible. And now it's a new space for the people. Excellent, excellent. All new for pedestrians, for the people, you know, no cars. I love it, I love it. How is it affecting you and the visitor, the fact that we got Madrid Central, that we got more pedestrian street, less traffic? Is Gran Vía or the city center is never a quiet place because this is a very alive city, but the thing is crazy, it's amazing. I mean, we can feel the less traffic. Actually, believe me, we can feel a better air. I mean, it's, it's fantastic. Of course, Madrid isn't the first to try to remove cars from its city center. By working with companies offering greener electric options, there are more ways to explore the center than ever. Already widely available in cities around the world, electric scooters arrived here last summer. You feel like a kid almost, you know, it's like you drive around and it's like you're having fun, you know, and it's the joy of riding. It's uh, a great way to move around. Commuting with our scooters, you know, has become fun. How good do you think is Madrid in terms of uh, green transportation? I would say that Madrid, I went, even 10 years ago or even five years ago, it was like a, a, a car mm, kind of like driven city. And now I think Madrid is becoming the biggest lap in the world and it's living a fantastic, vibrant moment. So you have uh, tons of different means of transportation. And it's super exciting because the, the, the city council took a very bold move doing Madrid Central. It's far from being perfect, but it's going towards the right direction. Or people are starting to leave their cars or their private uh, vehicles home and, and starting to take either public transport or one of the shared vehicles. Scooter users leave them wherever they are when they get to their destination. 
but some people worry they littered the streets. What would you say to those people who are a bit unhappy with the idea of having all these scooters lying around? We are aware that, that I mean, Douglas system comes with a, a lot of benefits and wants some inconvenience. It's just a matter of like getting used to it. It's, it's new for everyone, including us. So we need to find together with, the, with our competitors and with the city officials ways to, to kind of like move forward in a responsible way. This is like being a kid again, woohoo! So what if you are a traveler going just short distances around the city center? To pick one, which is going to be better? The old public transport system or the new kids on the block? Pedro, ¿qué pasa? To find out, I roped in a friend. Pedro here is going to take public transport. I'm going to take one of these electric scooters. But Pedro, this is not a race. Mm -hmm. So I will go steady and safe, and I want you to do the same. OK, okay. you promise? I promise. Are you ready? I am totally ready. Ready, go. So my first challenge is to find a scooter. In just a few seconds, I found one that is 30 seconds walk away. It's a quick scan of the barcode and I'm off to catch up with Pedro. Now, I got to say one thing for the scooters. While they do take a bit more effort and concentration, they have to be more exciting than taking a bus. And if you don't know the way, you can easily get lost. Todo para allá recto. But if you need to get somewhere quickly, well, it looks like I made it there first. Hey, Rafa, you're here. <laughs> but only just. You cannot believe it, I just arrived here literally like, you know, a minute ago. You pay, okay? Uh, of course. <laughs> And if you're heading to Spain this spring, here are the things we think you should look out for. Seville's April Fair is huge, and what's more, it's not even in April this year. From May 4th, more than a thousand tents are pitched along the fairground to the southwest of the city. And for the whole week, the site becomes the place to eat, drink, and dance the night away. It's a great way to get a fun flavor of traditional Andalusia. The Mulafest Urban Arts Festival has become something of a fixture in Madrid since it was established in 2012. It's pretty diverse. Everything from tattoos to circus arts to motorbikes are celebrated here. You'd better hurry up if you need tickets, though. The whole thing takes place just a week from now. Many think spring is the perfect time to visit Granada's spectacular Moorish Alhambra Palace. In the summer, it gets incredibly hot and busy. You may have missed the best of the blossom now in its Generalife gardens, but you're still guaranteed some stunning architecture without the stifling heat. And while you're in the south of the country, why not check out the restored Caminito del Rey in a crevasse close to Malaga? The narrow walkway was reopened in 2015 after more than a decade of closure. It's more than three kilometers long and only a meter wide, and used to be called the world's most dangerous footpath. But these days, there's a bit more fencing to help stop you from plunging over the side. To Sweden next, and an archaeological treat that's become the most visited museum piece in the whole of Scandinavia. The Vasa lay in the Bay of Stockholm for more than three centuries before its discovery in 1956. We dropped in to meet the people whose job it is to protect the ship for future generations. My name is Lisa Monson. I'm the director of the Vasa Museum. The Vasa is a ship that was actually built in the 17th century, uh, but sank on her maiden voyage. So the Swedish king at that uh, time, Gustavus Adolphus, he needed more warrior ships. So he ordered to build this very big ship 
uh, that should be the flagship uh, in the Swedish Navy. But she only sailed for approximately 20 minutes. A wind caught her sails and she leaned to the side. And unfortunately, the cannon ports were open. The water came streaming in through the cannon ports. She got heavy and leaned to the side and actually sank. The Vasa is 98% uh, original, which is unique in the world. There are no other ships from the 17th century of this size that is this well preserved. The reason that uh, the ship is so well preserved is that it sank in the Baltic Sea, where we don't have ship worms that you have in more salty water. So thanks to the British water in the Baltic Sea, uh, she was well kept. Right now the museum is going through a very important phase and that is focusing on preserving the ship for the future. If we wouldn't do anything, uh, the ship is slightly moving to the side and she is sinking about one millimeter each year. And we don't want to have that uh, go on forever because it will be a breakage at some point. So many people ask us how come that we have this success since it's actually built on a failure. Uh, and I think that failure is actually something that is a part of evolution. We need to uh, allow ourselves to fail to build success. Stay with us because still to come. It's one small step for tourism in space and one giant leap into your favourite Van Gogh. We've got the best things currently trending in the world of travel. And I'm in Latvia, plunging headfirst down an icy hill. Lucky old me. So don't go away. Time now for Trending Travel, a monthly look at some of the best travel-related stories, pics and videos making news online. Three, two, one, release. Really. Did you ever dream of being an astronaut as a kid? Fire. 50 years after the first moon landings, Virgin Galactic recently successfully tested a manned passenger flight to the edge of space. And now they've just signed an agreement to launch flights from the UAE, hopefully bringing those childhood dreams a step closer for those who can afford it. Back on Earth, Las Vegas has always been the home for high rollers. And now here's a new hotel room for the very biggest spenders. It's got two floors, has six original works of art and a pool overlooking the strip. If you're tempted, then the price tag is just $200,000 a night, or yours for free if you've got over a million dollars in credit with the Palms Casino. In the more traditional art city of Florence, locals have formed the graffiti busting group, the Angels of Beauty, to restore the city's ancient sites. These volunteers have armed themselves with special cutting edge lasers because traditional cleaning methods can damage the stone. The scientists say the new techniques are capable of safely cleaning any surface back to its former glory. And maybe this could be useful in helping you travel in a foreign country. This recent video from Matthew Brennan in China has had over 2 million views on Twitter and shows how facial recognition software is now being used to direct passengers to their airport gates. So I discovered the system when I was traveling in southwest China, in Chengdu. To my knowledge, they're piloting this new system. It's not available yet in Shanghai or Beijing. 
uh, you can't speak to it. It's uh, only a facial recognition uh, system where it will tell you your flight information, your flight status, uh, whether it's been delayed or not, and how to get to your gate. Uh, that data for my face, I assume, uh, I'd be surprised if it wasn't coming from the security check. Super helpful or sinister? You decide. Now, lots of you have sent us your pictures this month using the hashtag Travel Tuesday. Here are some of our favourites. Spring is here in the Northern Hemisphere, and that means huge amounts of people travelling to Japan to see the iconic cherry blossoms. Here is the daytime shot from Reiko Sato of the Tokyo Tower. This stunning photo is from Tetsuro Takahashi, and this one from Sunaina Amualia was sent to us on Twitter. Remember, keep sending in your pictures. Now, let's meet the travel filmmakers and vloggers who've caught our eye this month. If you're in Paris anytime this year, then the Atelier de Lumière is asking you to step inside the artwork itself with its new Van Gogh exhibition. With its 140 state-of-the-art projectors and 50 speakers set in the mood for what they call a new emotional and dynamic approach to art. This hugely popular museum had 4 million visitors last year and is looking to have the same hit again this year. Well, that's your lot for now, but don't forget to send us your best pics, clips and stories and who knows, maybe next time you could be trending in travel. Gauja is Latvia's largest and oldest national park. But we're not here this week for the peace and quiet of its lovely forests. We're here for adventure. And it starts just south of the park in this little town. Welcome to Segulda's bobsleigh track, one of the very few in the world where tourists can get the same adrenaline rush as professional racers. Built under the Soviet Union in 1986, the track has played host to international competitions in luge, skeleton and bobsleigh rides, with some obvious success. The track is now used as a training venue for several Latvian champions, but there are no competitions on today, which is lucky for me because it means I get to try it out. Although having a look I don't really feel so lucky. First, I'm meeting the man in control of the sled. Hello there. My pilot. Hello. This is the ice track, try not to fall over. <laughs> I'm Krista. Yes. Good to meet you. So tell me, what do I need to do? No, first, you need the helmets. OK. Next, get inside the bob, sitting, hold, not only the hands, but hold your body, your muscles. Mm -hmm. And we go down, and uh, that's up. All right. So as long as I've got good muscles, we'll be okay. I'm in. Yeah. I'm in safe hands. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> okay, let's go. Get the team together. We're about to set off, 100 kilometres down a very icy hill. But luckily, I've got an expert pilot. So well, fingers crossed, it goes boss. very smoothly. Apart from the pilot steering the bobsleigh from the front, a team also includes pushers and a brakeman. But tourists get it easy. They just need to duck in and hold very tight. This track is almost 1,500 metres long, and you need a pretty strong stomach to manage its 16 curves. Some, one of the most intense experiences of my entire life. <sighs> that was like being in a very, very active, very cold tumble dryer for a minute and a half. I don't, I don't even know how long it was. That was completely insane. Whew. Another winter sport that can take your breath away is this, the skeleton. Imagine a luge with no brakes or steering aid that you ride head first. 
Martin and Thomas are brothers and they're both world and Olympic champions in this sport. It's our home track and uh, we did many runs here. I think for learning it's great. Yeah, I agree because uh, if you learn and you can survive here, then you can survive everywhere. You must love this sport to devote so much of your life to it. What do you love about it? I, I don't like trainings and all this stuff, but uh, what I love is competition. It's like, that's the best, best part for me. Well, I don't think I'm ready to try one of the full-blown skeletons, but there is a tourist version available that's a little bit more my speed. Wish me luck. It's called a frog, and for this one, there's no crew to make me feel safe. The track in Sigilda could now become an Olympic venue too. It joined Stockholm in a bid for hosting the 2026 Olympic Winter Games. Answer in June this year and in the meantime... Oh yeah, I could go again. Right now, let's go. Sadly, that's all we have time for, but coming up on next week's programme... The game's on. God's queen. Mike's in Norway, where one of the world's most enduring games has seen a huge revival, thanks to a homegrown grandmaster. I would say my favorite player from the past is probably myself, like three, four years ago. <laughs> my heart's beating so fast. <laughs> So do join us then, and in the meantime, you can sign up to our social media feeds where you can share your travels with us and the world. Until next time, from me, Krista Lowd, and the rest of the Travel Show team here in Latvia, it's goodbye.